It's an old saying in fashion that you are what you wear. For decades, African style has been gracing catwalks around the world. But some of its designers say what African fashion really needs is more African customers. And you might be wondering, can I afford it? Well, this week we ask, who are Africans wearing these days? And what does that say about the evolution and economics of Africa's fashion industry? Later on in the show, we'll also look at fashion's racial and cultural divide. Will all fashion house apologies and the global backlash lead to redress or just window dressing? Hello and welcome to Our Voices. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick and with me are Oriane Itangishaka and Ayen Bior. Also with us is Estella Zafa. She's a Washington-based designer and owner of Estella Couture. Welcome, Estella. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and joining us via Skype from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania is Nisha Kanabar. Um, Nisha, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So before we get straight into it with our guests, let's take a look at how some African designers are ruling the runway at home and abroad. This yellow dress with flower ornament is made of dyed obon bark fabric, a material from Cameroon. It's one of the many designs of Haute Couture collection up for show at his debut appearance at the Paris Haute Couture Week. This coat, made of dyed raffia fabric, is also from Cameroon. It's the first time a designer from Sub-Saharan Africa will be joining the Paris Fashion Week and it's a source of pride for the Cameroonian designer Imani Ayesi. I have been fighting for more than 28 years. I dedicated all my life to my work and the time has come for something to happen to me, for the French Federation of Aute Couture to give me a place open the door to me. Materials for the designs are sourced from different parts of the continent, including Burkina Faso, Ghana and others. The homage to Rafia, the homage to African music, the homage to Paris, all this is filled with great pride and a great love for what he could cultivate. He relayed this to us and there was such an incredible emotion. But there's a history to Aisi's creativity which dates back to his childhood days when he made dresses for his mother, a one-time winner of the Miss Cameroon beauty pageant in the 1960s. I started designing very early. I would do little drawings on the floor and then I would steal the dresses of my mom, which I would cut up. I was punished for this and then much later, when she saw that I had something, she ended up turning over these clothes to me to give them a second life. Ayisi considers his efforts as vital in changing negative narratives about the African continent. For a very long time, people have done a lot of work, a lot of good things, and with a lot of inspiration. Everyone is inspired by Africa. Everyone talks about Africa. Everyone loves Africa. But also sometimes everyone spits at Africa. And sometimes when they want to do something on Africa, Sometimes it's done without Africans. Sometimes I think it's a shame. What he has shown with fabrics that are deeply rooted in African textile heritage, which is so rich and so deep with materials like raffia. We saw wonderful raffia skirts and coats. So with this textile heritage and his own creativity, his own view, he has breathed new life into it, which is very much welcomed. The 51-year-old designer is happy with his decision to source many of the fabrics directly from workshops in West Africa. That way, he provides jobs for local artisans. You know, this is certainly very interesting and, and kind of inspiring to see. It really does make you feel good about the industry itself. But there are some struggles. And I want to start with you, Anisha, in Tanzania. You know, 
is it true, do you agree that what African designers need right now is more so than greater representation on the global stage, is really more of their clothing in the closets of Africans? Uh, yes, I think it's really a combination, to be honest. I think it's the eternal uh, push and pull of PR or sales. And I think you can't have one without the other. The ultimate goal, I think, is always for a designer. However much you push it uh, promotionally, it's about closing that loop when it comes to sales. And it's about bringing the designer to the customer, whether it's a global or regional clientele. Um, we personally have created Industry Africa as more than just a platform. It's a digital experience. It's about building an emotional connection with our audience and really pushing that conversation forward and having people understand what it means beyond just having a name, having that story behind the brand as well. You know, I want to bring Estella into the conversation here as well. Um, you know, you, you had a brick and mortar store. Where really is the future of of fashion for um, African fashion designers. Uh, is there still room for that storefront or do you feel everything is going online? There's definitely, um, there's definitely room for storefront because uh, when, you, when, you, when you sell things online, it kind of limits the clients to what you have, you know. So as long as, um, I mean, I'm from Nigeria, we have parties for uh, Fedora, we have wedding parties, we have our uh, child naming ceremony parties and most times, Nigerians are having what we call a shebi, which is like when people dress up in the same color. You can't buy that off of the internet. Something you still have to go to a brick and mortar store or go to a, um, a, a tailor, a designer, someone that you have to actually do your customized measurement and get that done for you. So we can't do without that. And in Nigeria, there has been increasing calls for to see more African-led e-commerce platforms, actually. I'm just wondering how practical that really is. Yeah, and especially if you think about the shipping costs, right? Because, you know, I, for example, once spent $50 on a dress that cost me $70. It was from Ghana. This dress that I'm wearing is from a designer based in Kigali. Um, his name is Indai Senga. Now, the only way that I was able to get this dress was my friend was in Kigali and he physically oh, brought it brought for it me there. because I wanted to avoid those shipping costs. And so when you talk about practical, when it comes to African designers, I think that the biggest factor in determining whether me as a consumer if I'm going to buy their clothes, it's always the shipping. And Nisha, I just wanted to ask you about this. You know, I mean, I'm, we've heard that there's a lot of challenges um, that designers face, but when you think about, you know, these extra or these extraordinarily prices and shipping, you know, what do you make of this? Um, is there a solution to making sure that African designers can create clothes that um, that we here in the diaspora um, can reach, or other people even across the continent can buy and have it shipped to them at at, uh, at fair prices? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think uh, there's a major trust barrier that has really prevented people from shopping online and especially on the continent. Um, from payment platforms to logistical issues is a major one, I think. Um, not only intercontinental e-commerce uh, to Africa and uh, other parts of the world hasn't is sort of uh, nascent and burgeoning, but intracontinental e-commerce hasn't really broken through. And I think logistics is a major issue uh, here for that. And it's actually something that's on the agenda in a big way for companies like DHL and FedEx. DHL in particular is our logistics partner. Um, I think with regards to breaking down that trust barrier it, it, for Africans, it's about being able to um, first go through the idea of commodities and being able to shop commodities before taking it deeper and really trusting the process of, of fashion, of shopping for fashion, which I think is a lot more personal um, than other than um, than anything else. So um, yeah, I think I think that is a big issue, but I think with a trust aspect to um, the user experience, with the trust aspect to the product, to the designer, I think um, I think we can we can get through that, and especially um, sort of a very tight logistic loop. Right. Nisha, since you're on the ground, you can maybe have a much better perspective than any of us here. But uh, what do you think is the main issue in making um, uh, mass producing outfits for people in the diaspora, maybe for the shipment to be much less expensive, as Ayan has pointed out? I, I see two problems. I see infrastructure as well as electricity. Uh, is that one of the things that African designers are struggling with, maybe in Tanzania or anywhere else around that area? 
Uh, yeah, I think um, designers definitely struggle with scalability as an issue. Um, there needs to really be a stronger link between the creative process and the ultimate production of it. Um, when it comes to lack of production facilities or weak textile manufacturing sector, um, all these issues kind of throw off a, de a designer's business model. It makes it more expensive to produce and thus, you know, uh, alters the pricing strategy. And limited sourcing means limited quantities. Um, so yeah, I'm with that plus, of course, the made-to-order model that's you know very common with burgeoning designers is not scalable unfortunately um so so industry africa we really look for brands with the ability to scale up their sizing and production and that that's uh, a core part of our uh, narrative and if you look at brands like uh, south africa's makosa or uh, senegal's tongoro um makosa's really nailed the uh, production process when it comes to preserving his craftsmanship and his story um and tongoro in particular is a very interesting um perhaps newer brand on the scene that sells premium African ready to wear at a very accessible price for, for, for any uh, clientele. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I wonder what role social media has to play in all of this. I have found a lot of new designers on Instagram in particular. I've heard that that is a great platform for young designers who want to show their stuff. But I also hear that it's not good. And Estelle, I want to, Estelle, I want to hear you know, your experience. Um, Social media definitely is a must for any designer right now because, I mean, it's, this is not like back when you have to put advertisement in newspaper, you know. And uh, due to the whole world is a global village right now, that's the way, like, you know, you saw some designs yeah. in, on Instagram of something probably in Ghana or Nigeria, you know. South Africa. Exactly. I mean, there's so many designers exactly. that I found so, just on Instagram. I mean, the, it's something, something we can't do without, but at the same time, there has to be, like, an element of... Um, leveraging or maximizing the use of it because most designers you see especially in the upcoming ones they think it's okay to just i mean to them it's just like put out your design there people go oh ah that's amazing mm -hmm. but that's not paying your bills mm -hmm. yeah you know? so it's all about like putting it out there making just like um she said from uh, tanzania making it accessible that people can actually get it when they want it people should be able to click on it mm -hmm shop for it, buy it, and have it delivered to them. And then there's that element of trust, because sometimes what you see on Instagram during a photo, photo shoot, is different from the actual fabric. The quality is different. So it's like it's got its pros and cons, mm -hmm. you know, but something that we can do with her. But it's a, I think it's a work in progress, because even the best of designers, like the big high-end designers, are mining the rest, they all still market their stuff on social media. So. And that really brings up this issue of speed, right, in, in this day and age. Yeah. Is there a battle between fast fashion and high fashion? I mean, Estella, you work with high fashion brands, but if you look at even um, stores, storefronts like H&M, yeah. um, whether that's online or in the store, um, Zara, Forever 21, I mean, yeah. I'm from South Africa, and those stores are there, uh, you know, yeah. and people they, people know they come from abroad, and people mm -hmm. want a particular look probably more than they yeah. want a particular brand right, these days, yeah. because the look is affordable, the right, brand yeah. probably isn't. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work, and how do you see that playing out, fast fashion versus high fashion? I think everything depends on individual styles, individual taste, because some some one person might want to dress in like looking different, avant-garde, high fashion, standing out, or maybe have a red carpet event. So it depends on what the need for the fashion is at that point in time. And like you mentioned, like something like Zara, where like we we're talking about earlier, when some designs are basic, you know. So I think overall, due to economic reason, the fast fashion might have more people trending towards it, mm -hmm. while the high fashion will be people that can actually afford it. Does maybe. that compromise creativity? Maybe? Yeah, it does sometimes. Yeah, it does, you know, because um, say Beyonce calls me now to make a dress for her. Believe me, I'm going to shut everything down, take my time, <laughs> you know, put gold threads and, and this everything. this actually happened to a, a designer in Agancio. Yeah. Uh -huh. Beyonce wore her dress mm -hmm. and it pretty much went viral. Yeah, you know, but in that kind of situation, uh, you can be sure that the design she made for Beyonce, the materials, the tools, the f everything she put in there for Beyonce is not what she's going to put in, say, a girl that is having her prom come, say, I want to look like Beyonce. It's not going to be the same thing. You have to scale it down, you know, like right. for less price, try to achieve the same look. Mm -hmm. So that really brings everything in, you know, that really makes things Because different. your customers yeah. are going to want to look like Beyonce. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. But then they can't pay Beyonce's price. You yeah. know? Are you right. going to deprive them from looking good? Yeah. You know, so let's say if you use like a 
$500 a yard uh, lace for Beyonce, you now have to look for the $70 a yard lace for the person. Right. So it's kind of like achieving the same look, but the materials, whatever, the components of that particular garment is different. You know, right. so, yeah. you know, I, I think in a, in a future show, we really need to also tackle the garment industry in itself and the challenges around that. And we yeah. will get to that on another show, I do promise. <laughs> I also promise that I am a very, very cheap customer, so I'm not going to need Beyonce lace and do what I can afford. As long as it looks good, that's what matters. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is look, the end of the yeah. day. So, Nobody knows um, how much it costs. Knows. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think, well, think about it. Most high-end stores are always doing buy one get one. Right. Yeah. So the sales. Great. I'm a sale but, girl. <laughs> thank you. But um, ladies, it has been fantastic to have you both on the show. Estella Izafa, thank you so very much for your time thank and being you. here in studio with us. Thank you so much. Lisha Kanabar <laughs> in Tanzania, thank you so much for your time thank and for joining us. We but, hope to have you back on the show again soon. Thank you. Have a good one. Coming up, Race and the Runway. We'll talk to The Washington Post fashion critic Robin Given about discrimination and diversity in fashion. We'll be right back. Being part of Our Voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them. And bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. You're with Our Voices, welcome back. Now, racial tension and friction touches many of us in many ways every day. And the fashion world is no exception. That industry has long been criticized for its struggle with diversity, inclusion, and racial insensitivity. Of late, there have been a slew of fashion house apologies doing the rounds. Prada, sorry for this collection of offensive keychains and figurines, which appear to resemble blackface. Now, in case you don't know, that's historically racist imagery of African Americans. Then there are these images racially charged symbols in fashion that have been met with outrage around the world. So why is this still happening and what should be done about it? With us is someone who might have some ideas. Robin Given is a fashion critic for The Washington Post. She's also a Pulitzer Prize winner for criticism and the author of The Battle of Versailles, the night American fashion stumbled into the spotlight and made history. Robin, welcome to the show. It's so nice to have you. you. I just <laughs> love reading that, the, the uh, Battle of Versailles. Uh, I'm, I'm exhausted. <laughs> this whole... The struggle is real. This drama really exhausts me because, let me put it in context, I was born un and grew up under apartheid in South Africa. I thought, like, you know, that's where we deal with these kinds of issues. And then you come and you see this is on the global stage and it plays over and over again. I'm so exhausted that people don't get it. Why is the fashion industry still struggling with racial issues of diversity, inclusion, cultural insensitivity in this day and age? Well, I mean, I think it's a, a part of a bigger issue, which is that uh, as a culture globally, uh, race is still an issue and the fashion is part of the global culture. So. Uh, there's no reason why it should be exempt from those issues. Um, the other piece of it is that, I mean, I do think that the industry is becoming ever more global. And as a result, that almost means that it has ever more choice chances to be offensive <laughs> because it's sort of spreading its reach and it's spreading its reach in areas where they, it does not necessarily have people who are experts or who are part of that culture or come from that culture. And, and I think the, the last part of it is uh, that in the fashion industry still, white, European, is sort of the norm. It's the standard. Mm -hmm. It's the starting point. And everything is sort of bumping up against that, um, rubbing up against it, creating tension with it. But that is sort of the standard against which everything else so is measured. So do you think that they, they do get it? They just choose not to acknowledge insensitivity culturally? Or do they just say, we have the money to fix the damages? Racism, oh, is, ex <laughs> well, but you know, racism is expensive. Yeah. It is very expensive. And I am a glass half full kind of person. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think that any of this is intentional. Mm -hmm. I think some of it comes from this fundamental belief in the industry that creativity is something that should be freeing. Mm. That the moment you tell a designer that they are limited to a particular 
realm, mm -hmm. that is the moment that creativity is limited. So I do think that there's this element of wanting to push boundaries, mm -hmm. wanting to be subversive, wanting to see how far uh, you can take something, and also wanting to be expansive and being and to sort of fuel your creativity with as many different influences as possible. But the demand for culture sensitivity is justified. In, oh, absolutely. In. And I think one of the reasons that we are seeing um, so many more uproars about it is because social media has, one, allowed the images to spread very quickly uh, to a very wide audience, but it's also allowed people who do find offense to be able to speak up and to have their voices amplified. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, I think, you know, there were probably some of these same issues that were raised, but they were raised quietly. Right. You know, over coffee with your friend. Right. You mm. didn't have, you know, Twitter or Instagram. So one tweet multiplied times a thousand is a PR nightmare that, exactly. that, that a lot of industries um, have to really pay attention to. And I want to talk specifically about Marc Jacobs and ask you, mm -hmm. where do we draw the line between cultural appropriation and appreciation? Mm -hmm. Marc Jacobs is one person who has gotten in trouble a lot of times. Um, he dressed his models in dreadlocks one year, um, Ubuntu knots another year, mm -hmm. um, and head wraps another year. Mm -hmm. And in all three cases, he drew a lot of criticism. Yeah. Now, you actually wrote about uh, the incident of the dreadlocks and you think that people were overreacting which I do agree with um, but I want to hear your thoughts on where we draw the line between cultural appropriation and appreciation and and, and should Mark Jacobs be exonerated <laughs> <laughs> well I mean I don't think it's a hard and fast line you know I think it's a very blurry line and one person's cultural appreciation is someone else's cultural appropriation um, I think that the points of sensitivity are when someone embraces a culture but does not seem to acknowledge in any way that they are embracing someone else's culture. Mm -hmm. And that could be a, a simple matter of, you know, having a little statement before your show begins mm -hmm. saying this is where the inspiration comes from. Mm -hmm. Or making sure that if you are using dreadlocks that you have a diverse cast of models, mm -hmm. uh, which Mark Jacobs did. What did you think of Kate Middleton's tour to Pakistan? Because she wore dresses, traditional Pakistani dresses um, mm -hmm. from Pakistani designers. And Twitter was very pleased with how she presented herself. It seemed like she was not trying to draw attention to herself, but mm -hmm. she was trying to reflect it back on the designers and the culture. Um, what is the difference between that and you know other people who wear traditional dresses that are not uh, their own culture? Well, I think sometimes it's a matter of, is are you wearing the traditional dress and using it as a kind of costume, using it as a way to sort of uh, uh, bulk up your own sort of bona fides mm -hmm. in a situation? Or are you doing it because you really want to express an appreciation for the work that other designers have been doing? Or sometimes using it as a political statement. Right. Using it as a political statement, using it as uh, a point of diplomacy, mm -hmm. using it as uh, a point of connectivity to say mm -hmm. that this is something that is perhaps unfamiliar to me, but I have an appreciation for it. And, uh, you know, coming back to my, to my point earlier, racism and racial insensitivity is really expensive yeah. because you have to apologize. People will boycott your, your product and then you have to give millions of dollars Kim to Kim Kardashian lost charities. $10 million in her kimono brand not too long ago because the Japanese were just very angry that she would dare to try to make money off of their own tradition. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine $10 million out of just one small mistake. mistake. Mm -hmm. Right. And as you said earlier, then you have to hire the a chief <laughs> inclusion, inclusion <laughs> officer. Exactly. exactly. So, you know, exactly. it doesn't really pay off that. Well, Robin Given, thank you so much for your insights, and we hope to have you back on the show it's sometime soon. We will probably be stumbling into this topic <laughs> again in future. We do appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. After the break, we show you a few stylish things in African fashion that caught our attention. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Our Voices. As the African fashion industry becomes an increasingly strategic and important global player, there are a few exciting trends and themes that caught our eye. And for me, of course, you ladies might be surprised or maybe not to find this out, but I have been really excited to see South Sudanese women completely dominate the fashion industry. I mean, we there was a time when it was only a Lekwek, but right. now we have Adut Akech, we have Ducky, we have Anok Yai, we have Grace Bowl, Kuth Will, who are on the cover of Vogue and just really doing their thing, and that has just been incredible to witness. I think we all know that for South me, Sudanese women have that market corner. Yes, they do. Um, for sure. But for me, I'm definitely loving the new haircuts. I mean, Zozibini Tunzi showed up on the world stage, you know, as Miss Universe oh, in that yeah. haircut. I loved it. I think I might actually just shove my hair off soon. Can we do it on set? Yeah, can we be there for that? Challenge, <laughs> challenge, I might, I okay. might. <laughs> we'll, we'll so the new haircuts that. are just lovely. The natural hair and just showing up and, you know, just, you know, it's clean, cute. Yeah. Uh, great messaging as well um, for, for other girls, you know, who... I th what I find the most exciting, and what I'm seeing, even as we were working on this program, was really just looking at the various fashion weeks and fashion shows being held in very unexpected places. You know, usually we see like the image behind you, Ian, from Lagos Fashion Week, and that's wonderful. Those amazing, that looks amazing uh, images, it? right? It but makes you um, proud. and then places like Cape Town, Johannesburg. But it was really exciting to see places like Kinshasa's yeah. Fashion Week and mm -hmm. new designers yeah. um, coming on the stage and really introducing themselves. First of all, to other, um, you know, to others in their country. To the Congolese um, to see in places like even Bujumbura. Yes, Bujumbura uh, has a fashion week. Right, and, <laughs> and, and it's, 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 it's in, it just shows how prolific the industry is is becoming. Mm -hmm. um, even in places now beyond Senegal, and in really I think in Kampala, Kampala Uganda, yeah. um, they have a fashion week there as well. It's a great platform for designers to introduce themselves in their own countries first, mm -hmm. where it is very important for them to instill that national pride and get respect there. And, mm -hmm. and do send us your photos and your stories of African fashion and styles that have caught your eye. We'll leave you with a quote from the editor of British Vogue, Edward Enenfall, who used his voice to say, I think fashion can tell a story about celebrating differences, can talk about how different people are, how diverse people are, and for me, that's where fashion really succeeds. And we want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our guests who were with us earlier. We'll see you all next time. Goodbye.